Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Jesse Norman, a member of British Parliament, current Minister of Transport, and he holds a Master's in Doctrine of Philosophy from University College London. He's the author of many books. His new book is Adam Smith, Father of Economics. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Jesse. Hello. Why a book, or let's say another book, on Adam Smith? It's not as I mean. It's it, it, there are a lot of books on Adam Smith have been written. Yes, I mean Smith isn't quite uh, up there with Abraham Lincoln or Winston Churchill, but there certainly have been a lot of books, and there have been some very distinguished books recently. I mean, if one goes back, uh, there was a life by Ian Simpson Ross in the nineteen nineties that was pretty definitive as to the facts of Smith's life, and there was a lovely book by Nick Philipson, who's just died, alas, on Adam Smith. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, which is, I think, still absolutely, well, less, in fact, probably a decade ago, which is absolutely still worth reading for his intellectual context. Uh, and there have been other ones. Jim Ott- Otterson's written a book and uh, other folks as well, James Buchan. I would say this, that all of those books are really interesting, but uh, all too often they, in my judgment at least, have... Uh, omitted two things that I think are really important and interesting. One is they don't really talk about Smith's current impact or potential impact on policymaking. So what is it that's alive and breathing in Smith's ideas that make him so worth studying today? And um, my book has entire half of the book, second half of the book is dedicated to exploring those issues. And they range well, we can discuss them, but they are technical issues in economics, but also very fundamental features of the way capitalism has panned out and how it could be improved that come out of Smith. Uh, then the, the, but the second reason also is that I think that relatively few of those books give the reader a, a really a, a feel for how the ideas fit together and uh, how the philosophy uh, and the economics and Smith's astonishing ideas about social psychology, how all those things mold into one integrated body of thought. And I think it's really important to have that if you want to understand the true depth and power of what Smith is saying. Can you tell us a bit about the intellectual climate that he grew up in? Because the, the Scotland of Adam Smith is – it seems like it's it's this environment second only to like – classical Athens in terms of just all of these amazing thinkers having these amazing ideas and talking to each other. Yes. Uh, I mean, you have an astonishing moment in the 18th century where there there are almost two parallel enlightenments interlocking going on. You have this astonishing group of people in London, um, Dr. Johnson, Edmund Burke, Joshua Reynolds, David Garrick, Oliver Goldsmith, and the like, many, if not all of them, members of Dr. Johnson's club. And they are leading revolutions of different kinds in different areas, English literature, or it may be of politics, or it may be of the theatre um, in different ways. That's all fascinating. In Scotland, you have the genius of the Scottish Enlightenment. And the Scottish Enlightenment is a remarkable phenomenon because it brings – it suddenly out of nowhere as it appears, you get – uh, this amazing, dazzling array of thinkers, uh, notably David Hume and Adam Smith, but also uh, William Robertson, historian, Adam Ferguson, uh, Lord Kames, uh, um, Hutton, Black. These are all foundational figures in different areas, ranging from history to English literature, Hugh Blair, um, chemistry, geology, all coming together. And the question is, why, are they, why does that happen? And I think it comes out of A whole series of things. One is that Scotland has the world's best educational system at the time. It's got borough schools um, which are committed to uh, educating a relatively large segment of the better off part of population, if you like. It's got a a strong educational system at the local level. Uh, It has five universities. So the idea that it may seem astonishing now, but the city of Aberdeen in northern part of Scotland had as many universities as England. Uh, in the 18th century. So England has Oxford and Cambridge and uh, Aberdeen has King's College and Mariscal College. Uh, and of course, there's also Glasgow, St. Andrews and Edinburgh. And it's a v- and so the Scottish Enlightenment is a very intellectual and academic enlightenment. Uh, it doesn't come out of the salon as it does in France. It comes out of the universities. Um, and also, it's not conditioned by a thoroughgoing revolt against religion. 
So the French Enlightenment, much more rationalistic in that sense. Um, but actually, many of the feature figures of the Scottish Enlightenment are uh, themselves senior members of the Church of Scotland. So what you have is a, a point at which um, Scotland's um, evolving uh, economic and uh, social strength um, suddenly requires explanation and a group of highly motivated, um, thoughtful figures emerges from the universities and from the church to interrogate these things and to think about them. And that is an astonishing moment. And of course, it's very small, um, small number of people. Um, they all know each other. They're all interacting with each other in a very intense conversation, intellectual debate. And that, again, pours fire, uh, uh, fuel on the flames. It seems to me that there's a commonality to some of the members of the Scottish Enlightenment. Obviously, Hume and Smith, who were very good friends. But overall, if you have people like Adam Ferguson and Hutchison, even someone like Thomas Reed, there's a focus on sort of emergent systems and human behavior and yes. actually studying the way people are. If you compare it to, say, Descartes or anyone in the sort of rationalistic tradition, you have a much more focus on the growth and evolution of, of systems of knowledge of things coming from the kind of bottom up. Uh, and I, how does if, if, if you agree with me on that, how does Adam Smith fit into that? Well, I think that's true. There is a uh, Scottish focus on the here and now. You get, as it were, the origins of what used to be referred to as the common sense philosophy. In Thomas Reed, you get the very naturalistic focus of uh, a Hume and a Smith in building what they think of as a science of man without resort to external authority of the church or of uh, uh, the aristocracy or the like. Uh, and you have uh, this very interesting phenomenon whereby uh, Scotland itself uh, is – uh, growing so fast that it's generating uh, facts that have to be explained, economic facts, social facts, uh, is it what you might call national developmental facts, trade facts. And so there's an enormous array of things that are happening so fast that those intellectuals are engaged in explaining not merely the deep ideas, but the current phenomena. And I think that gives it a different feeling to many of those other places. In that, in the what year was Smith born? Uh, Smith was born in 1723. So that we have in the historical economic social situation at the time, where was Scotland at that point? And what kind of changes did he see? I mean, you mentioned them a little bit, but so, also they had so, just unified with yes, England, correct? So, so, so Scotland had, had uh, famines in the 1690s. It was a very heavily rural... Uh, and uh, in some cases, peasant economy, uh, it was uh, very divided religiously between Presbyterianism and uh, Catholicism to a degree and Episcopalianism. Uh, there was a strong divide between the lowland areas and the highland areas, the Gaelic-speaking parts. So you have a, uh, a country that's very divided – and, of course, you have the Jacobite Rebellion, 1715, and then Jacobitism, uh, which is the support for the um, Stuart monarchs in Scotland and therefore a rejection of the Hanoverian uh, dynasty, which um, had come to England. And so all of those things are bubbling up. Now, in 1707, Scotland and England come together uh, in what is called an incorporating union. The Scottish Parliament is abolished. And although Scotland gets to keep its law courts and its educational system and its system of law, it um, becomes part of Great Britain with England. And crucially, Scottish merchants are open to the full force of competition with English merchants, but ultimately protected by the Navigation Acts. And the effect is predictable. Uh, the Scottish economy goes downhill in the face of the extra competition. And then in due course, it starts to benefit. And by the time of Smith's uh, birth in 1723, it's starting to benefit. By the time Smith's grown up in 1750, you know, he's to be 27, 
uh, or thereabouts, the Scottish economy is really starting to motor. And it then begins a process of economic development over the next 150 years, which makes it the Asian tiger uh, of the world. And uh, astonishing changes and levels of industrialization and urbanization and income growth and uh, development. And uh, that early, those early stages of that process are what Smith is seeking to explain and to understand through the wealth of nations. When we look at his works, he kind of comes onto the map with theory of moral sentiments and then obviously wealth of nations is a big thing. But but how did he get to there? Like what does his career look like up before he starts writing these classic texts? So Smith's uh, life is very much that of an academic. He uh, goes to school locally. He then goes to Glasgow University as a young man. Uh, he then goes on uh, to – Balliol College, Oxford, on a scholarship. Uh, he spends most of the 1740s in Oxford. He has a horrible time. He really dislikes Balliol, which is a very high church, uh, Tory um, uh, institution, very uninterested in the life of the mind at the time, uh, very expensive to live in, very anti-Scottish. Um, it's, not a, it's not a good fit for Smith. Um, and uh, he then comes back to home, spends a few years working, living at home, trying to th break through uh, and then eventually gives some lectures through the patronage of Lord Kames in 1750, 51. And out of that then comes the professorship at Glasgow. And that Glasgow becomes his base until 1763. While he's there, he writes the theory of moral sentiments. He does a lot of the early thinking on the wealth of nations. While in the 1750s, people misunderstand that. They think 17, that uh, his, The Wealth of Nations is a completely different book and only comes in the 1770s. But actually, he's thinking about it 20 years earlier. We can tell that from work that um, uh, is reported at the time. Uh, and then in 1763, he goes on a uh, grand tour with, uh, of France uh, to Toulouse and to Paris with his great patron, the Duke of Buccleuch, who's a young man at the time. Uh, and who's been put in his care in order to understand the world. I mean, what a marvelous idea. Probably Scotland's biggest landowner is given Scotland's greatest uh, uh, philosopher and uh, economic thinker as a tutor. And then he comes back. And then very broadly speaking, he spends the rest of his life either at home in Kirkcaldy or latterly in Edinburgh. So it's a very quiet life, but it's a life that's very conducive to uh, the life of the mind and the development of his ideas. When did he meet Hume? Well, we don't exactly know, but we think it's in the early 1750s. There's an apocryphal story of him uh, being discovered in his rooms at Balliol reading Hume's, uh, I think it's the Treatise of Human Nature, um, or it may be the essays. And you know, these are regarded as wildly seditious and ultimately atheistical texts. And so he gets into some trouble with the, uh, um, the senior common room at Balliol. But uh, Shortly after that, they meet each other and they form a very strong relationship that lasts until Hume's death in 1776. The theory of moral sentiments is often ignored. Uh, at least it wouldn't be the first answer to the trivia question that people would say, who's Adam Smith? They would say wealth of nations before the theory of moral sentiments, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, in, in your book, you, you discuss how these are connected. But roughly speaking, what is the theory of moral sentiments about? So the theory of moral sentiments is a – work of social psychology. It's often thought of as being a work of moral philosophy. It's just not true. Um, it's a work of psychology. It's, it, the question is, um, uh, in a society and as human beings interact with each other, where do their moral values and social norms come from? And Smith tries to give a, a, an account of that that's naturalistic in the sense that it doesn't rely on these external sources of authority that I described. And Smith's uh, idea is startlingly simple and clever. And it is that essentially we get them through exchange of regard. So he thinks man and is always man, of course, at that time. That's the way they write. But he says man naturally desires uh, not merely to love but to be lovely. That is to be worthy of love. And so human beings essentially act in such a way as to elicit the regard or the esteem of others. Now, that would make moral behavior really a function of the conventional wisdom if it wasn't uh, corrected by something. And so Smith has the idea of an impartial spectator. Uh, and that idea is one that corrects for the purely parochial or idiosyncratic uh, 
aspects of a judgment. And both of those ideas, the idea that you can bootstrap your way into social and moral values by um, through just through the mere fact of social interaction, that's proved to be an astonishingly influential idea if you look at all of the way in which game theories of human behavior and norm formation now uh, have played out. Uh, and the idea of an impartial spectator has an incredibly important effect uh, on Kant when he comes to write about um, uh, the universalizability of moral uh, values through the idea of duty uh, in the um, uh, uh, in his uh, second critique and also um, uh, in his uh, other moral writings. So if morality is said is for Smith is part of this kind of bootstrapping process of trying to become increasingly lovely, where does the impartial spectator come from? Like what? By what standard is it the impartial spectator, and where do the the moral standards that it uses to judge us come from? If it has to be judging the the bootstrapped system that we're stuck in the middle of. Yes. So so it's a great question. So the idea is not that the um, impartial spectator brings a set of substantive values to the picture, because otherwise um, he, as it were, be helping himself to That's the values from outside. Yeah, that yeah. would be you know the classic um, Deus ex machina type explanation. So that it, that's not it. it it is that what the um, impartial spectator does is to force the judgment not just to pay attention to what people at that time contingently want, but as it were, what uh, anyone in that circumstances would want. And the reason why it's a spectator is very interesting because I think the thought is that as um, that the person is seen to be acting a certain way, that's the spectating part, but is also aware of being seen to act that way. And therefore, you get a a triadic idea of, as it were, their expectations being placed on them and their desire to satisfy those expectations. And that's what creates the um, the norm of good behavior. And if you think now today about, for example, work that's been done on littering or graffiti and the kind of effects of social pressure and pro-social or anti-social indeed norm confirmation, that kind of – those ideas often key off Adam Smith without realizing it. And in fact, I think of Smith as not just the father of uh, economics but also the father of social psychology. I've had – I've seen in some articles where people are critical of Adam Smith calling him you know, the, the father of market fundamentalism or whatever you want to say. They, they cite a line in – the theory of moral sentiments, which is pretty famous. I'll paraphrase basically that one morning you find out that uh, thousands of people in China died and then you also get a paper cut on your finger and you spend the whole day thinking about your paper cut more than the people in China who died. Uh, why is it? Why is that a bad characterization of what Smith is getting at in the theory of moral sentiments through that story? Yes, I understand. So uh, Smith's point, so Smith is, first of all, Smith is not a cosmopolitan. So Smith recognizes what uh, have sometimes been described as circles of sympathy. So we have a sympathetic engagement. That is to say we have an ability to understand how something strikes someone else and then to empathize with that in our own reflection, our own conduct. Um, but he doesn't think that that creates moral obligations that are indifferent to where they are. You know, um, he thinks that people have a duty to care for those around them, their friends, their families, and those duties progressively erode as you go further away. And that kind of seems to fit with the psychology that many have described. Um, now, his point in the famous uh, China earthquake example, which is the one you're describing, uh, is that um, the sense of duty that people must have to overcome this natural psychological, uh, um, as it were, instinct must be strong indeed if it's able to do that. And yet we do have a recognition that we owe duties even when we may not in fact have those tracked by our own psychological uh, um, passions and experiences. And I think that's a, in, in some respects, it can be quite a profound uh, insight. And of course, the net effect of thinking about this social embedding that is created by the mere fact of human interaction is that it gives you a context for markets. So it's a corrective against the idea which you often find, particularly in caricatures of Smith, both of the right and of the left, that he's somehow um, a, 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 a 
a contemporary economic theorist who only thinks in terms of mathematical models without reference to human beings. The exact opposite is true. For him, a market is not something that's just defined in terms of a model, although that can be a useful way of thinking about it. It's something that's, that's defined in quite situated terms as a cultural artifact and therefore mediated by norms, practice, habits, traditions, and moral values and norms. And that's the connectivity, that relationship between exchange of esteem and exchange of goods and services. That's the connectivity that links the two books. You discuss I'm, – I'm really glad in your book that you – as a lawyer, that you discuss lectures on jurisprudence a bit, which comes out – well, it never comes out. We can talk about that. But he, he seems to be working on it in between theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations yes. in the 1760s. Uh, what do we see in that – in the lectures on jurisprudence that's valuable? And also, why don't we really have them in good form? Well, it's a fascinating question. The story of the lecture on jurisprudence is uh, a, a, a really interesting story in its own right. So he, he gives the lectures in the 1750s and uh, they must, we hypothesize, have been included in the works that he instructed his executors to burn at the time of his death. And the only reason we have them is because three, really two and a half sets of those notes as made by students of his lectures, have now survived just by pure luck. Those are some really good note takers. And so, <laughs> well, and these lectures, well, and well, let's not forget, um, there was some value to taking Professor Smith's notes and then, um, you know, them. if not selling them or letting others use them and stuff. So these are, these are you know, they're quite carefully taken notes. And therefore, you know, we get quite a good understanding of what the lectures were. And they don't always agree, but there's a lot of overlap. And the fascinating thing about that, so first point is, uh, what are they about? Well, they're, they're really about um, property and um, the nature of property and rights and injuries against property and injuries against the person. In that sense, they are very interesting um, from a kind of legal jurisprudential perspective. Um, property is the link that sits between uh, sentiment and, uh, and goods and services because property – has rights, but it also has norms of treatment associated with it. And uh, for Smith, property, the rights of property is dependent on the form of government. And therefore, there can never be an economics that's independent of an understanding of government because government is intrinsically involved in guaranteeing the status of property. And as government evolves and is progressively able to, to defend new kinds of property and to allow those cases to be juridically decided or otherwise arbitrated, so capitalism or market activity, as it then is, capitalism doesn't come to the 19th century, can can elaborate. So you get a progressively evolutionary view of markets and government together that is proto-Darwinian coming out of this um, astonishing insight. So then the question is, well, why did Smith, with this incredibly interesting and still amazingly important and relevant uh, analysis, why did he destroy those lectures? And the reason, I think, is because ultimately – he couldn't bring them within the full panoply of the exchange-mediated architecture of his overall thought. So his thought is you get exchange of goods and services in the economy, you get exchange of morals and uh, of esteem and regard in uh, uh, the creation of moral and social norms, and you get um, exchange of language and ideas in uh, human communication. That's the architecture of the overall idea. Where you fit in his theory of government isn't obvious. And I think that's the reason why. And he was absolutely punctilious about not giving the world uh, anything but a fully finished theory. And that itself, if I may just very quickly end, rests on an idea about property. So he thinks that humans have a right to an unblemished reputation as a property right. And he's determined to assert that property right. He never says this, but I think it's not just modesty, but his desire to maintain the integrity of his own property that means he won't allow that to be undercut by a premature publication. So I'm just curious. You mentioned that this looks – to some extent, there's some proto-Darwinian elements. Do we know if Smith had an influence on Darwin at all? Oh, yes, we do. And there's no doubt he did. Um, Darwin was a very enthusiastic reader of Smith uh, when he was at Cambridge, and uh, I think it's pretty obvious that he 
had understood the evolutionary nature of Smith's account of human development of, of political economy. And indeed, I make the argument in the book that in some respects, that theory of cultural evolution isn't merely anticipatory, but is in some respects part of the theory of evolution more fully considered uh, for Darwin. In uh, the second half of the book, as you say, you go over Smith's life and thought, and the second half we talk about its relevance to today and some of the, the criticisms of it. Uh, you list five myths in particular that I think are relevant to the way people think he, on both sides. Uh, he could be a boogeyman to the left or people on the right oversell him. So I'd like to talk about some of those. Uh, yes, sure. One of them is, uh, we kind of broach on a little bit, but this idea that there's a a tension in the relationship between the theory of moral sentiments which, and the rapaciousness of the market, I'm putting mm. that in scare quotes, uh, of the wealth of nations. Mm. And you say that that is, that is not true. There is no tension whatsoever. Uh, no, I think that's, I don't think there's no tension whatsoever because the, these are, they, you know, these are, these are slightly different works. The focus, they're, they're written in slightly different ways. The focus is on different topics. And, um, you know, I don't want to underplay the extent to which they are, um, uh, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, Smith has just got one idea that he seamlessly works out across the two. Um, but it's pretty clear, I think, that they are part of the same picture. Um, the theory of moral sentiments, the trouble is that no one reads them individually and attends to them in any depth, or very few people do, and especially a very small number of people who, who quote them selectively actually read them. So it's quite important to go back to what they actually say. Um, the theory of moral sentiments is an entirely general theory of how human moral and social values get formed and the norms that, as it were, arise from them. Um, within the field of political economy, those norms and values have play in markets. So that, in a way, is a special example of a general um, moral psychological theory that's already been advanced. When Smith comes to revise the wealth of nations, he's revising the theory of moral sentiments pari passu. So these can't be works where there's a deep contradiction between the two, or indeed much of any contradiction. He sees them as an integrated body of thought, um, and he writes them to the best of his abilities as hopefully finished works within that general um, overall conception. Uh, and of course, the theory of um, moral sentiments is preceded by um, some very important work that he does and that he makes public at the time, which is designed to protect his ideas to the wealth of nations. So he says, you know, peace, easy taxes, etc., are all that is necessary for an economy to flourish. That's an attempt to lay down some of the principles of the economy um, so that they're understood to be his before he comes to get to that stage of the theory 20 odd years later. So I don't think there can really be much doubt that they're a single integrated whole. And when people see the theory of moral sentiments as a work about altruism or sympathy in some comp sense of compassion, that's because they just haven't read the book. And when they read The Wealth of Nations as a hymn to greed and inequality and self-interest, that's because they've ignored Smith's radical egalitarianism in much of The Wealth of Nations and, uh, of course, his much richer conception of um, both of human well-being and of human psychology. Can you talk about that radical egalitarianism? Uh, I mean, you just sort of mentioned the sure. other myths that he sure. he was not an advocate for naked self-interest and he was not pro-rich and all these things. But you said radical egalitarianism. I think that might surprise people. No, sure. So, so I mean, Smith is not a radical thinker in the proper sense. He is not a revolutionary. Um, he didn't support any of the radical causes, single annual parliaments, uh, you know, a universal franchise. He just doesn't, you know, he's much more small C conservative than that. He's positively rude about utopianism and the attempt to substitute theory for, as it were, a nuanced understanding of practice. He is extremely rude about the so-called man of system who uses what Burke would call a geometrical reasoning as a substitute for solid experience and an understanding of tradition and the value of history. So he, in that sense, he's very definitely a small c conserv conservative. But if you look at his system of natural liberty, it has remarkably r radical elements in it by modern ears. So it is a system uh, in which 
uh, uh, it's not a full system, but it's a set of ideas in which there is, for example, no primogeniture. He's very opposed to that. So there can't be passing down of large capital sums from one generation to a single individual in the next generation in order to protect them. They have to be dispersed. Um, markets uh, inhibit the building up of large surpluses because they're so competitive that they compete away all but the thinnest economically available profit. Uh, he's um, very much on the side of the workers in terms of the argument that they have with the masters in businesses because he thinks that masters have inbuilt advantages of power and information which make it an unequal struggle. Uh, and because he recognizes, I think it's probably fair to say, the value of people getting paid an appropriate wage for the work they do. Um, and of course, finally, he is prepared to contemplate potentially quite onerous taxes if they are levied fairly, transparently, at low cost, and according to the four principles of taxation that he lays out, including a land tax, which is a very radical proposal. So when you put all that together, you can get a Smith. And in general, he's a very egalitarian thinker. So he, he, he talks about... Um, uh, uh, you know, um, you know, he says all for uh, what does he say? All for ourselves and none for others has always been the vile maxim of the masters of mankind. You know, he, these are these are not small statements. Wealth and Nations was published, I believe, the same year as the Declaration of Independence. Um, did he then? Did he have an opinion of what was going on in America? Uh, yes, he did. Um, uh, he was asked for, uh, and and he was specifically asked for his opinion in seventeen seventy eight. Uh, he gets. Uh, he gets invited uh, to write a memorandum on what the government should do. The government's casting around. It's just had its head handed to it at the Battle of Saratoga. Things aren't going very well. Um, and so Smith has asked for his advice. And his advice is a, a kind of little model of uh, a good policy paper. He scouts various different options and then he says what his preferred one is. His preferred one is an incorporating union between Britain and America. So he responds to the idea that there is no, there should be no taxation without representation by saying, yes, the Americans should have representation in the British Parliament. Uh, and uh, he said, I don't think it's going to happen, but that's what should happen. And his, uh, uh, then there's that astonishing moment where he says, of course, this will mean that the seat of government transfers itself from Britain to the colonies over time. Mm -hmm. And what is so interesting now is that that perfectly captures worries about sovereignty that you know, many people in Britain have had with regard to the EU and the Brexit uh, arguments. You also write about how you, it seems that not only do people who are not very friendly to capitalism oversell how, how capitalistic, so to speak, Adam Smith was, but that people who are more on the libertarian side do the same, that, yes. that Adam Smith was not a radical uh, libertarian who yes. wanted no government whatsoever. He, you mentioned the taxes. Yes. What other types of, of government was, was he broadly in favor of? I mean, there's a very wide range of interventions that Smith is prepared to contemplate. And he may be right or he may be wrong, but the point is he is prepared to contemplate them and one can't argue from that. So uh, just to give some examples, um, he talks about a cap on interest rates to discourage uh, speculation. He thinks about um, separation, uh, what he calls, uh, in the banking system in order to stop a general a conflagration from becoming general by having, uh, as it were, party walls in regulation. Um, he, uh, of course, is um, supports uh, the Navigation Act, which was possibly the biggest intervention in commerce of any kind at that time. Uh, and so I don't think it's possible to hold that um, Smith is a laissez-faire economist in the modern sense. Uh, but what is interesting is if you think about, go back to his idea of natural liberty, markets in the middle of to late 18th century are um, thickets of state and church and guild regulation. So any removal of regulation from the markets in that context is almost certainly going to be both welfare enhancing and equalizing because these laws have largely been created by the insiders to um, benefit them at the expense of the outsiders. So you can see why um, that nuanced conception of the state might lead one in a different direction today where markets are in many cases freer. And what's so fascinating, just very quickly, is that we can pull out, and I do pull out in the book, a quite an elaborate three-fold theory of 
crony capitalism from Smith's writing. So you, you have a, uh, an account of rent extraction, which we've seen everywhere in the financial industry over the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, you have an account of principal agent problems. Well, that's we pay these people and they run off with our money. That's CEO pay. Um, and you have uh, this idea of asymmetries of power and information. Well, that's the technology platforms. And if you think about one of the things that's fascinating on the social psychological side of Smith, just to pick up one final point there, is, of course, he thinks that the driver of human competitiveness in part is the social demand for status as well as the competitive desire to better oneself economically. And that has negative effects in terms of stimulating materialism, which we recognize today. And it has demoralizing effects in stimulating social comparison of a kind that we see everywhere in many of the uh, online platforms. So his criticism isn't just an economic one of what you might call modern developments in technology. It's also a social and psychological one. So it should be obvious to our listeners now that you think there's a tremendous amount of value in his works, not just from a historical standpoint, but, you know, stuff we can still learn today. But then what does he get wrong? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I think he gets quite a lot um, of things. Well, I think he gets some things wrong and there's a lot he misses out or doesn't understand. So uh, one thing he pretty clearly gets wrong is um, he, he, he is an advocate of what's come to be known as the labor um, theory of value. And I think it's fair to say that most economists today would regard that as a quaint uh, overhang from the past rather than a, uh, an economically valuable piece of analysis. Uh, what's interesting in terms of the stuff he leaves out, he doesn't talk about technology, uh, which of course is by any account a great driver of value. He doesn't really talk about innovation, which is an absolutely central feature of markets on a, on a modern analysis. And he doesn't talk about industrialization. And what is amazing uh, is that if you take the facts as he reflects on them and presents them uh, and you just spool a little bit forward, Smith dies in 1790, that's just the moment where Alexander Hamilton is thinking about the materials that are going to go into his report on manufactures, 1791. And Hamilton uh, you know, is, an, is essentially an unlettered genius who is able to see by reflecting on the wealth of nations within the American agrarian agricultural economy, the seeds of a modern industrialized powerhouse. And then to ask the question, how should that be financed? And what should the public finances look like that go alongside that? And those are acts of imaginative genius, which um, start from a platform that Smith has laid, but which Smith doesn't take himself. And I think it reflects incredibly well on Hamilton as well as on Smith that they were able to have that uh, a, a intellectual exchange even after Smith's death. The insights of the wealth of nations that we talk about, specialization, gains from trade and stuff like this, but one of the things that he writes about extensively that uh, is relevant today is trade, inter international trade and what we call mercantilism. Yes. Um, what would, what would Adam Smith think of Mr. Trump's uh, trade policies or even maybe a better way of putting it, how familiar would what Trump says about trade seem to Adam Smith uh, in, in the sense of rec the eternal recurrence of these arguments? Well, it's a fantastic question. And I can only thank American politics for generating these questions just at the moment my book goes on sale. So <laughs> people can read up heavily on the, on, the, on the basis for them, historical and intellectual. Um, I think Smith would find this style of argument extremely familiar. Um, and what is very interesting, one has to remember some facts about um, Britain and uh, America, and we'll just put this into that context. So Britain had had some form of tariffing or trade barriers since the end of the 15th century. It's the 1490s, Henry VII. Um, so the idea that somehow these were um, a, a modern for Smith invention is nonsense. They've been embedded into British policy for hundreds of years by the time he comes to write The Wealth of Nations. And by the way, in many ways, they've been highly effective. I mean, you know, the Navigation Acts are there for a purpose and he supports them. Um, and they are an extremely um, effective way of transferring value from colonies towards the mother country. That's what they're designed to do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, when Britain discovers free trade at the time of the repeal of the Corn Laws in the uh, 1840s, and Smith becomes a secular saint of free trade and is grabbed by those people who then 
erect a free trade conception of Smith, which makes him almost unrecognizable 100 years later, uh, 1876, um, uh, they are, that's not really a world of free trade. That's a world of imperial trade. Britain doesn't really have free trade, even in the end of the 19th century in the way that is somehow fondly imagined. And actually, America more or less never has free trade. America didn't, doesn't, doesn't have it uh, before the First World War. It doesn't have it, sure as heck, doesn't have it between the wars. And after the Second World War, um, there are many reserved areas of the American economy where free trade does not apply. And many tariffs are being applied, and notably in the agricultural area, et cetera, et cetera, which still persist. So, you know, we can get a little excited about free trade as a kind of Elysium um, without realizing that actually um, it, in many ways it never existed. Uh, so then the second, the, the final thing I would just say about Smith is the idea that um, that you sometimes hear alongside the idea that Smith is a cosmopolitan, which is that basically trade is a um, is is a uh, uh, an area in which people can come together to reach a kind of higher degree of harmony um, is absolutely not Smith's view. Smith isn't does not believe trade is zero sum, in contrast to some folks today. But he does, but he absolutely does believe that you know nations have interests and energies that are going to cause them to behave in ways that are jealously preserving. The phrase jealousy of trade is an 18th century phrase. Um, jealousy preserving that even though warfare may be being gradually supplanted by the bourgeois arts of economic exchange, they are still going to be um, and can be pretty brutal. And Smith, to that extent, is a, is a realist about uh, trade as he is about many other things. We are seeing, and the discussion we just had is certainly related to this, we're seeing a kind of softening of enthusiasm about capitalism and markets, not just in the US, but throughout much of the world. And obviously, that's distressing for us at the Cato Institute and for people who understand economics and likely would have been distressing for Smith. But is there value in Smith, not just as he articulated these kind of basic principles of economics that we know to be true or largely true, and those those principles push back strongly against this trend, but in the way that he talks about these things or the way that he articulates these things, that, that Smith in particular could be a, a force against this trend. Yes, I, I think there is. Of course, as I've said, capitalism is not something that Smith's familiar with in the sense of autonomous pools of capital. Smith's a theorist of open markets. That's the key point. Um, and that aspect of thing, I think, continues to hold up remarkably well. I mean, if you look at what, you know, what is driving the astonishing gains that have been made in the incomes globally of the least well-off. Answer, trade, trade, trade all the way. It's trade that's been rescuing um, the least well-off well in Africa, it not, not you know, uh, potentially substantial amounts of aid. It's the mobile phone, above all, has made a huge difference. So trade and technology. So, so that's the first thing. Of course, one of the reasons why uh, capitalism has got a bad name is because People are identifying aspects of it that Smith anticipates and understands. Um, so, so you know, Smith doesn't believe that, um, uh, as it were, um, markets don't have negative effects as well as positive effects. He recognizes, he thinks that people can be alienated by the work, the repetitive nature of the work they do. He thinks that there are losers as well as winners in markets. Um, one of the reasons why political economy is what he is interested in rather than what we would consider economics is because in political economy, you always ha you can't be immune to the distributional consequences of what you're doing, as well as their total economic effects. And therefore, globalization, the rather uncritical view that people had of globalization in the 1990s, is not something that's compatible with a Smithian viewpoint. So the astonishing thing to me is that friends of open markets, and by extension, uh, friends of capitalism, haven't adopted Smith's recognition of the downsides and um, sought to ameliorate them, as well as Smith's understanding of the um, pathology of crony capitalism in order to create a pressure for an economic system that does address some of these social concerns. And um, I think if they did that, they would be much more effective politically as well as economically. And, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, I'm looking for people who are interested in these subjects to start thinking, for example, uh, as we have in Britain, about, um, about wages. You know, one of the things that we've done recently in Britain, as you may know, is to mandate a national living 
wage. Obviously, I'm here. I'm not speaking as a government minister. I'm speaking as a uh, as a, an independent-minded academic uh, and writer and scholar of Smith. But you know, a national living wage is an attempt to push up um, uh, wages. Uh, and that has not had any effect in terms of removing people from the labor rolls or reducing uh, unemployment. On the contrary, the effect of it appears to have been, in some respects, to be crowding in people. So there may be more in a dynamic economy uh, to be gained from thinking about some of these things um, in ways that are outside the norm and rehabilitating this, as well as thinking about some of the concerns that Smith identifies if we're going to defend the market system and defend what Smith cared about, which was not capitalism, but commercial society. And commercial society, a society in which people are presumptively equal to each other and in which, uh, uh, as it were, the legitimacy of the system relies on everyone having a fair shake and a chance to do well. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.